Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Boost Tech HD here, and as you know, uh, it's back to school, back to work, back to college, and back to university for most of us now since the holidays drawing to a close. Uh, so I've decided to do a, another one of my podcasts for a AQA ASICT, and I'm going to be really pick up from where I last left off. I haven't really done one of these in a long, long while, probably like almost half a year ago, but uh, I thought I'd carry it on now. So. I'm going to generally pick up from where we left, last left off, and that is topic three, and this is design of solutions. Uh, so this is quite a big topic, uh, and it's quite a, a massive portion of the actual sample work, which, which is required, as I've mentioned before, which is required for the AS uh, AQ exam board. You need to take that into the exam with you, and there is a massive body of questions which you need to answer related to the particular sample that you have chosen. And as I said, there's a range of things you could possibly do. So if you're thinking of choosing a level ICT for the AQ exam board, uh, you're going to be given uh, a scenario, or you can choose your own scenario, or your teacher may supply you with one. And uh, you need to either create a website, a PowerPoint, a database, a spreadsheet. There's a, there's a massive, um, massive wide range of options you could possibly create and obviously the option is even wider than that. So we're going to carry on with topic 3 now since I've last, last left off at topic 2. Uh, so we're going to take a look at the designing of, or the design of solutions. Uh, so if we take a look at the uh, very main section we need to really answer the question about what is design and ICT tools. So when you look at design tools you basically look at the software that you're hoping to use for the particular uh, solution which you hope to provide. So this could be a, a, a range of things, you may use one piece of software, you may use two, three, it really depends on what you want to do. And this also includes, you know, certain applications within the software that, you know, you also need to use and basically all the tools, if you, if you like, that I provide with the software which will aid you when trying to create this particular solution, for example. Uh, if I'm in Photoshop, I may use uh, the crop tool, and there you go, tool here, for example, and that, and that will, you know, crop the picture down, which will make my, you know, um, output suitable for the user. You have, you have, there's just one thing you've always got to do, relate your solution back to the user and how it's suitable for them. So by using that tool, I'm able to crop out irrelevant uh, information, which will then, you know, help to, you know, improve my solution. And uh, and choosing design uh, tools, especially especially with ICT, uh, there are some tools that are better than others, of course. Uh, for example, you need to compare and contrast different softwares and different tools, and try and really pick the best one that's uh, that's suitable for the job and really most relevant for the actual solution that you hope to provide. Uh, so, as I said, there's many that you, can, that you can compare and contrast. It doesn't always have to be just two. You can pretty much compare up to about ten, really, and you know try and narrow down your options right down to the final two or even the last one that you hope to choose. Uh, for example, if you're producing a newsletter, uh, you really have to think what's going to be the appropriate software to use. Say for example, uh, we have Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Dreamweaver. So there's three examples there. You need to, you need to really narrow them down and choose and, and think what, what's most suitable for this, uh, this particular um, source that I've been given. So the, obviously the source is a newsletter. So it's going to create a lot. Of, you're going to be using a lot of text, so that pretty much rules out PowerPoint because PowerPoint is more of a display type of software. And then you're pretty much left with Dreamweaver and, and um, Word. Then you've got to ask yourself what are you more comfortable with, and I would say definitely Microsoft Word. So you rule out Dreamweaver, and then you're pretty much uh, down to your the one that you that's probably best for you to use. In that case, Microsoft Word, and in my case as well. Uh, so. Um, you also need to look at the document that you hope to produce and this is also again linked in with the software and what you need to be p pretty much using to make this software you know appropriate. Uh, the next big uh, topic in this section is ways of capturing data. Uh, this is quite a big topic as well. There are so many ways of cap capturing data. For example, I'm capturing data now uh, in the form of a podcast. So this is an audio uh, capture of data uh, in the format of sound, or if you're going to be really technical, you can give it a format of MP3 or WAV, and that is pretty much the format that I'm using, and this is a way of capturing data. Uh, so there's many others. Uh, it doesn't always have to be you know digital. It could be paper-based. Uh, so for example, um, oh, let me give you a few more digital ones. There's photographs. Uh, there's music which I'm using, there's moving images, and there's obviously the paper-based ones which I'm going to go on to now. So you've got application forms, for example, order forms, booking forms, uh, requests for further information, questionnaires, self-completion questionnaires, and this is going to be basically in the format of numerical data, or this is going to be in the format of text, textual data. 
Uh, you can also get data supplied from third party sources, for example, data from websites, uh, which is also quite a popular one. You know, you can get statistics, you can get uh, facts, and all these can come back right back into your sample work. And then you also got data supplied from other systems. For example, you may be using one software, you may require data from another software, so you may be using Dreamweaver, trying to create a website, then you also might want a database. Uh, from Microsoft Access, for example, you can bring that into the uh, Dreamweaver for the website and, you know, merge the two together. Uh, as we mentioned podcasts before, uh, one famous software which is free, as I've mentioned in videos before, Audacity, good piece of software and it's free and the sound quality is very, you know, it's high quality, you're going to get good quality sound. And as I mentioned, you need to also take a look at the format you're going to be capturing it in. And you really just got to plan, you know, for example, if you're making a, a, a radio broadcast or a podcast in particular, you really need to be using high quality audio, good quality microphone. And then from there, you can pretty much decide uh, how you want to plan it out. So uh, if we move on, uh, we can go with, we're going to be taking a look at more about error and erroneous data. So let's take a look at uh, one of the major topics, which is problems with inaccurate data. Uh, there are many problems when you when coming across inaccurate data. For example, if you are a business and you're making incorrect decisions, this will you know relate in loss of money, uh, goods being sent to the wrong address causes customer frustration. You also have a long time uh, sorry uh, sorting out mistakes can also be time consuming. And then you just lose, a, you end up losing and giving your company a bad name. For example, loss of goodwill, loss of trust, and it could be a, end up if it's a serious uh, offence, uh, you could be prosecuted on the Data Protection Act of 1998, which is also uh, going back to the law side of ICT, which is covered in Unit Two, which is quite a massive section. Um, so you have that as well, which comes after obviously Unit One. And then we're going to be taking a look at uh, validity and correctness of data. Now there's always a massive confusion when looking at validity and correctness and there's a massive difference in the two terms. Okay, when data is valid it means it, it, it fits within the actual, so, so for example if it's, a, if it's a database and we're looking for a name, I type in the name, I don't know, John Wilson for example. So if I, look, if I try and type in John Wilson, uh, I'll type into the search bar, uh, it'll search the database completely, it'll process all the information and then uh, the output will be uh, the name and the information if it's for example uh, it could be a prison record I've typed in John Wilson and his name comes up and all his information comes up and that would be um, valid uh, data since I've typed in a name which is in the which is in the database and it's valid and it's there for me to retake the information off okay so if I typed in something like I don't know Joan Wilson uh, that would be invalid because that name uh, would not be registered within the database and therefore that is invalid data because you're typing in data which is not obviously not valid and it's not going to fit within the actual database itself. So that's um, invalid data. And then when you're looking at correctness, okay, so um, for example, if I typed in John, uh, let's just say it could be someone uh, with a, a very similar name, uh, for example, John Wilson, maybe. John Wilson, so you got John Wilson, John Wilson. I've typed in John Wilson. I really, really wanted to search for John Wilson and I've typed in John Wilson. Now that is incorrect. However, John Wilson may still be in the database, which means that John Wilson is valid, but it's not correct because that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for John Wilson. I've typed in John Wilson and it's, it's valid because it's in the database, but it, to me, it's not correct because it's not what I was looking for. So that's the difference between validity and correctness. There's a big difference between the two. So uh, there are many ways in which you can reduce error and for using this, for using these as uh, examples, uh, there's verification and there's validation. And again, these are two separate things. So, for example, let's take a look at verification first. So, verification uh, is, is checking data against a paper-based form or another source. Uh, along with, so, it's checking data. It's almost like cross-referencing, really. Uh, you're checking data from one source against another to make sure it's correct and valid uh, for that point. So, there's two ways of doing it. You can proofread information. Uh, which is generally cheaper, or you can also do double entry of data, which is slightly more expensive because you have to employ two people to enter the data, and obviously this is you, you bring up cost concerns and things like that. But it is, I'd say, double entry of data is probably more secure than proofreading because it's easier for that one person to make a mistake rather than two people making a mistake. That's just you know it's, it's unlikely really. 
So a proofreading just involves, as I mentioned, just involves the readers reading of what they've typed and comparing it. Double entry of data involves two people and the, the, enters, the data is entered in twice. Uh, so if we take a look at types of errors which can, can occur, uh, this, this we break it down even further. So you have something called transcription errors and transposition errors. So transcription errors are made when uh, the data is typed in and for some reason, say if, if we're down the phone, for example, I might be talking to someone and they might not understand my accent. Uh, so if I'm talking and, and, and pronouncing words differently, then maybe someone from another country might not be, understand what, might not be able to understand what I'm saying and therefore struggle. And informa the wrong information is put down because they try to interpret it in a different way. And then this, this just creates a whole, like, whole heap of problems, which just causes, you know, wrong dates to be entered and just, you know, all sorts of annoyance between the customer and the, the salesperson at the end of the line. Uh, you've also got poor handwriting. I'm probably a culprit of this. My handwriting is not too good. But if people, uh, if you're trying to read what, uh, a piece of information or a paragraph that someone's written, you can't read their handwriting. It just leads to so many problems. So maybe typing would be a good idea, but sometimes that that can't be done. Sometimes you have to handwrite things, you know, for legal terms, uh, for example, signatures. Uh, so if, you, if you're handwriting things, try and keep it neat because the problem, the problem that may occur is that someone's trying to read it and they're, get, they're, make, they're getting words wrong. You know, they're, 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 they're trying to guess what you're trying to write and then therefore they're making mistakes and then this just leads into more problems again, which uh, just, you know, you, you, you're trying to play with fire though. You're pretty much entering wrong data by trying to guess what the person has written. And there's just general type of mistakes with the keyboard. Uh, so keyboard, entry of data, easy to make mistakes and, you know, can be very easily missed. And then this again leads to uh, invalid data being entered. Then you have trans transposition errors, which occur, again, maybe typing more so. Okay, for example, you may be um, trying to book a flight and your flight um, number is AB376. This is just an example. AB376 and then it turns around and you've typed in something like BA376 so what you've done you've got the letters mixed up you have got them the wrong way round and therefore again this is this is creating invalid data because you're not following the format as how it's been laid out and uh, let me give you an, another example you may have the numbers 5544 and then you might say you might say, uh, kind of <laughs> sorry uh, you might actually type in 5445 again the format is incorrect Therefore, invalid data has been entered in. So um, that's pretty much um, verification, and in all its uh, glory. Uh, so let's move on to uh, what's known as validation. And when you're looking at validation, they're mainly used with databases and some online. Um, you know, if, like if you talk, if you go onto Facebook, for example, or Facebook, YouTube, um, you're setting up a new email address. There's always going to be validation checks on those services any for any any it doesn't matter what you're signing up for there's always going to be a validation check check that's uh, needs to be put in place so as i mentioned there uh, there's validation checks that are put into place and there are there's about eight validation checks that you, you may be asked in the exam and that you have to know off by heart pretty much and what they actually do okay so the first is data type check and this check if the data being entered is the same as the data recommended by the field. So for example, if, uh, if you're looking at a field it's asking for just numeric data, that means if you put text in there, it's going to immediately just cross it off because it's just asking for numeric data. So that's numbers obviously 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, not A, B, C, D, E. That's basically what they're saying there. So that's data type check, make sure the, da the data is in the right format. So if it's either in numerical or text, it's got to stay in that format. And then you have uh, presence checks. Uh, these make sure that data is actually being entered in the, into the field. Okay, for example, uh, I'm signing up to YouTube. Uh, I've, I've almost finished now. They're asking for me to put in a password. I cannot leave that password field blank as that is required for security reasons. So you have to put the password in if you're going into YouTube. You can't go uh, go along on YouTube and say, oh, I just don't think I'll put a password in, just leave it open. Nope. You will not be able to progress unless you put the password in. So that's one thing you have to make sure you do. Uh, the next is length check. Um, this makes sure that the data being entered has the correct number of characters. Okay, for example, a phone number. Okay, here in the UK, 
uh, all our phone numbers are 11 uh, digits long so that's make so even if it's a mobile or house number you have the area code for example 0121 uh, that'll be the area code used and then you'll have your own home phone number uh, to go along with that and if it's a mobile number you'll have like for example 44 plus and then a certain amount of numbers or 07 and then a certain amount of numbers again but it will always equal to 11 digits so if you type in your phone number and it only comes up as 10 digits or 12 digits it's going to be wrong because it has not it's not it doesn't fill in with the length check the length check is exactly 11 characters so that's what has to be entered it can't be any lower and it can't be any higher than 11 so that that's a good uh, a check to make sure that people aren't entering a load of nonsense and making sure that all these phone numbers are at least going to be valid but whether or not they're correct is a whole different matter <laughs> okay so you have um, the next one is going to be a file table lookup and this is used quite a lot in many businesses so that for example um, let's just say for example um, I, I work at the Royal Mail which is basically Royal Mail is basically like a massive um, shipping company here in the UK and they basically do a lot of deliveries for letters parcels and things like that so uh, I enter a postcode for example um, W246YZ for example that's a postcode and I put that on um, some uh, I've, I've put down a letter or I've put it on a parcel and I've sent it to Royal Mail now that they will then check this up against my work they'll check this against their own database to ensure this is valid and that is pretty much a file table lookup when you just basically check in between two different databases uh, to make sure that the data matches and it's a valid street and it's a valid postcode in the UK that they can actually use so they're not just wasting their time posting things to uh, bogus addresses if you if you like uh, the next one is then uh, cross field checks and this is within one database for example again so I'll refer back to the password scenario uh, normally with a certain sign up uh, places online uh, they'll ask you to uh, do, mainly require you to do double entry of uh, passwords so you have to enter the password in two fields now if you get the if you type in one password in one and the other password in another, in another block and they don't match uh, you'll get a warning sign saying the passwords don't match and you won't be able to continue until the, both the passwords match and you know they have to match before you can progress and that is pretty much a, a cross field check it just it's mainly used on just passwords because they're trying to get the security thing right they don't want that to you know don't want any mistakes with the password security so they'll mainly use uh, cross field on passwords or you know bank cards and things that they'll mainly use cross field because they want to make sure that the person has understood they're happy with the password and they're just going to verify it again to make sure that's the password they're happy with uh, sorry <laughs> sorry um, so the uh, next uh, one is a uh, range check and these are performed on numbers only so okay for example uh, you're signing up to a, uh, a website again and the website requires you to be requires you to be between the age of 12 and 18 so basically teenage roundabouts uh, so if you put in a date of birth that is not within that range it will be rejected again because you have your obviously your date of birth does not match the, the the range given so again you won't be able to progress your date of birth has to has to fall basically between the ages of uh, 30 it depends if you're going to use boundary testing but I won't get into that though because that's a bit uh, advanced for this uh, section that we're on but uh, basically you want to get between the values of 12 and 18 that's what you want to basically between there if you're not if your age is not between there you won't be able to progress with the signing the signing up of a certain website for example and the the last one is uh, format checks uh, so this basically goes back to the transmission errors of the flight number uh, this is making sure that you've put text in in the right format so okay for example you may have letter letter number 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 so that would be a b one two three so you got the a b which is you basically your uh, letter letter and your numbers are going to be your one two three three numbers number 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 one two three and everything that if if, if um, a, a sign up uh, site requires you to enter data in that format you must abide by, the, by that format or you won't be able to continue you'll get an, a message saying that this format is, does not um, work in conjunction with the one given in the actual uh, database and you'll just be you'll get rejected and you won't be able to continue uh, with the signing up and 
that is pretty much the validation checks or it's pretty much the main ones that you need to know or the ones that are going to pop in the exam and that is pretty much it for um, uh, this one uh, you, the, you you may need to do some in, if you go back to class just some practice on databases for this topic uh, just play around with it really just you know learn all the data, uh, all the validation checks that you can do with Microsoft Access for example as a database uh, software just play around with that and you're able to just you know play around with how to you know work with the um, the database and how to do all these validation checks you know try and figure out how to get uh, try and get your head around this transposition and transcription errors and you know verification as this is pretty much database heavy this this uh, section here is just prim primarily database because this is what you're going to be uh, looking at with databases all these validation checks all these verification checks are going to be mainly um, put in the database so that's what you got to be looking at mainly but apart from that learning how to use a database uh, it does take a bit of time but if you just practice around you can also find a lot of YouTube uh, help tips as well and walkthroughs on how to use um, Microsoft Access. It's pretty simple once you've got your head around it and it's a pretty good video. Uh, if you, uh, pretty, video <laughs> pretty good software to use and you may even use it for your sample work, who knows. So anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this uh, topic 3. has been quite long. I might try and keep the, the rest of them short but this was quite a big topic. But anyway guys, this has been Boost Tech here. Thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget to rate, comment and subscribe and have a pleasant day. Bye for now.